The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful freedom and privilege to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us, and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm having to use a different microphone so it may sound hollow. There's always something going on. If something wasn't going on, I wouldn't be alive. So it's a good thing something's going on. Uh, I just got back from vacation. Uh, part of that vacation was spent at Putin Bay an island in Lake Erie. Now at uh, this island there was a battle in the War of 1812 and it was very interesting to go there at the time in which we did. It was uh, we got in to see some uh, shows of the how they used the weaponry in those days. Uh, I hope they didn't go as slow as those who were demonstrating. Some of those were 70 years old for sure. It could barely handle the uh, munition. But they gave a uh, show of how they fired their musket, also a show of how they used the bayonet, which uh, by international law, which is stupid, there's no such thing. And when a country goes to war, it's, uh, there's no rules in war, really. But uh, according to international law, due to that war, they outlawed the bayonet because of its effectiveness. How stupid. It's like outlawing a nuclear bomb. But anyway, uh, they talked about the War of 1812, gave a history of it. I got to hear the shot of a musket and the roar of the, roar of the cannon. So that was interesting. And uh, they had a little show there of what happened during the War of 1812, how we stopped the British uh, by cutting off their supply route to Fort Detroit. We might should reconsider and give it back to them. But uh, uh, it was actually a war with Canada. Uh, Great Britain owned Canada. And then after uh, the British uh, knew that they couldn't win, they decided to go in for a peace treaty, which has been in effect for 200 years, in which we would never fight the British again, and we haven't. And uh, also, uh, as part of that peace treaty, we would have an unprotected border with Canada. And that is uh, the longest unprotected border in the world, and the longest lasting for 200 years. And no, it's not the Mexican border. That is the second largest unprotected border in the world, aren't we benevolent? And that was without a peace treaty. But uh, as part of that, I got to see a uh, up close, uh, how they fought and the fact of uh, how vicious war was then, hand-to-hand -hand combat in many cases, and uh, it just g gives you more of an appreciation for uh, freedom through military victory. And on that note, since we're studying freedom, as I was going up there, we stopped in Amish country where I got a copy, oddly enough, of the uh, Ten Amendments to the Constitution, along with the Constitution and uh, the Declaration of Independence. What you hear crackling is a copy. They made it look like an original. But it's a copy of the Ten Amendments. Actually, it's the Twelve Articles. But I'll start with the third article, which we know as the First Amendment. And I'll read you our Ten Amendments, just so you can understand uh, our heritage. We don't necessarily follow these amendments 
anymore, and you'll recognize that as I read them. Here's the uh, First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, I've read many news stories where people who were exercising their freedom of speech, also their freedom of religion, uh, by peaceably assembling in their own homes, they've been told they can't do that due to some local regulation. Well, according to the Constitution of the United States, the First Amendment, uh, there shall be no regulation for the people to peaceably assemble. It doesn't even give uh, an address where they can assemble, it's wherever they want. The right of the people, peaceably, as long as you do it peaceably, there's nothing that can be done. And it doesn't give an address that, well, you can't do it here, but you can peaceably assemble over there. Uh, if it's your own home especially, you can assemble. I don't, uh, we have violated that principle and violated the First Amendment. The Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security for a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Of course, that's being infringed upon all the time. And it doesn't even say shall not be uh, or that the guns shall, shall not be confiscated. It says shall not be infringed, which means uh, you can't even tamper with it. But that's tampered with all the time with local laws and state laws and even laws from the federal government. The Third Amendment, no soldier shall in time of peace be quarantined in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. We have followed that amendment pretty precisely. The uh, Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon, uh, this is uh, little writing, so give me a, a moment, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Uh, we violated that, just go to an airport. The Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a pre presentment or of indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be sub subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. We violated that in many ways. All of the principles listed there, especially with regard to property, government can just call it a wetland, take it from you, and give you no compensation. That is a, a violation of our Fifth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the eyewitnesses against himself, to have com uh, compensatory um, process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. This has been violated many times uh, especially by the fact it says by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. They oftentimes move these court cases to different areas to get a more favorable outcome however they want it to go. And that's wrong. That's against the Constitution. But they do it all the time. 
So you see, we don't follow our heritage in any way, except for that one amendment that we seem to follow, and that is we don't want soldiers just coming in and sleeping in our home whenever they wish, and that doesn't happen. The Seventh Amendment. In suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined for obtaining, uh, or excuse me, any uh, shall be examined by any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. That's been violated. The, let's see, the Eighth Amendment. Excessive trial shall not be required, nor excessive fines be imposed, nor, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. <coughs> we try to fo fo uh, follow that, but uh, no system's perfect. The Ninth Amendment, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall be construed, shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, these aren't the only rights we have. We have many other rights and it shall not be construed that these are the only ones we have. In fact, all rights are retained by the people. That's what that means. That's been violated. The Tenth Amendment. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. And that has to do with states' rights, which are constantly violated. In other words, the Constitution lays out the laws that should be followed by the federal government, and it's very limited in its powers and what it should be able to do that's definitely been violated. All other powers are to be reserved by the states. That means the states can make laws where necessary. And if there are no laws, it can be the rights will be uh, respectively laid upon the people. So that uh, those are our ten amendments. And as you can see, we violate almost every one of those in our modern times. Um, which we don't follow the Constitution. We are not even the same country anymore, and we haven't been for a long time. This is nothing new and nothing that really has to do with politics. It has to do with the degeneration of a client nation to God and the fact that we've forgotten what freedom's all about, and that's because believers have forgotten what spiritual freedom is all about. It is our spiritual life and the pivot of mature believers that brings prosperity to a country no matter its form of government. The Roman Empire became a client nation to God and they were doing some vicious things at the time they became a client nation to God. In fact, they persecuted Christians, uh, especially during the first church, the beginning of the church, uh, but that ceased after some 200 years. But they reached their peak during a time in which the persecution of Christians was still going on. So it doesn't really matter the form of government or the, even the viciousness of the government. Blessing by association to the client nation comes from the pivot of mature believers. In fact, the greatest of believers, the Apostle Paul, was beheaded by Emperor Nero, and yet Rome still continued to uh, move in the direction of, after August of 70 AD, to become a client nation to God. Now what? how do I know client nations continue into the church age and that Israel is not the only client nation as has been reported to me as being said by some pastors who should know better? Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 21 verse 20. Luke chapter 21 verse 20. Luke 21, 20. This is our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And he's giving a prophecy concerning what's going to happen to Israel. And a prophecy then of what will occur after Israel goes out under the fifth cycle of discipline. We've already studied uh, the cycles of discipline. We are currently under the third cycle of discipline. 
in which uh, the economy is in a shambles. I don't even know why we have Labor Day. No one labors anymore. In just half a decade, this country has lost its economic dynamics. It has lost its vigor in just half a decade. And this was the most vigorous country on the face of the earth just a half decade ago. And so that's what happened. The third cycle of discipline came upon us and we are currently in a depression. Now they call it a recession, but it's a depression when you have but more than half the people not working. And that includes children and elderly, etc. But you've got uh, less than half the people pulling the cart and more than half the people sitting in the cart. So you know it's causing a drag on the economy and has stalled it out, basically. And we are in an economic depression. If you don't believe it, just uh, look at the attitudes of the American people. Uh, they all seem depressed. And that's what depression means. Under the economic depression, uh, people don't have money. They generally become depressed. Uh, and it's an almost a natural thing. It's something that you overcome by learning Bible doctrine, but you can only overcome it by learning Bible doctrine, and that is to learn how to live. And it's something you have to learn as a believer, to learn how to live in contentment with having just food, shelter, and clothing. And with those, you shall be content, is what Scripture tells us. And as a mature believer, you can learn how to be content with just food, shelter, and clothing, and nothing else. Now, it does not tell you to be content when you're starving. That's impossible, it would seem. But uh, under the concept of evidence testing, it has occurred that people have taken their spiritual life and have died of starvation or have died from a, a lack of some, of some necessity and as a result uh, they have died under evidence testing and will receive the utmost of rewards in heaven so they haven't lost out but for the majority of us with food shelter and clothing with those we shall be content now in Luke 21 20 it says when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies you will know that its desolation is near then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful what will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Now, of course, this is referring to uh, Israel during the second advent, uh, actually the coming of the second advent, during the tribulation. However, our Lord is speaking to the Jews uh, during, uh, directly uh, as if he were not going to be crucified uh, by the Jews. In other words, he's preaching to them as if they are going to go positive, but then he's now telling them in prophecy what's going to happen at the second advent. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. And in verse 24, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And in verse 24, there's actually a, a reference to the fact of Israel going out in 70, August of 70 AD. And the times of the Gentiles will begin. And during the times of the Gentiles, Jerusalem will be trampled on. And that has occurred all throughout the dispensation of the church age. <clears throat> so the times of the Gentiles we find in Luke 20, 1, 24. And Jesus Christ is warning the Jews of the removal of Judea as a client nation. Actually, I re referenced the second advent. That would be in Matthew. We're dealing in Luke now. Uh, so Jesus Christ is actually warning the Jews of the removal of Judea. That would be the, the present nation uh, that was there at the time, and the prophecy would be fulfilled in August of 70 A.D. So the mature believers are to know from the intake of Bible doctrine that Judea would be destroyed, and by practical application, this passage uh, was of the pivot was delivered. And so nearly uh, 1.1 million people were killed in the takeover of Jerusalem 
97,000 were taken captive. The times of the Gentiles refers to the fact that from 70 AD until the rapture, the tribulation, and the second advent, only Gentile nations will be client nations to God. In the tribulation, only individual Jews will be evangelists, and there will be no Jewish client nation, and that's where we get the reference of the 144,000 evangelists, uh, but there will be no Jewish client nation, and no client nation whatsoever during the tribulation. So when the fifth cycle of discipline came in August of 70 AD, it ended the function of any Jewish nation as a priest nation until the second advent of Christ, which is at least seven years away, and uh, it could be a thousand and seven years away, we don't know. Gentile client nations, therefore, have become the standard, and as a Gentile client nation, we should have a maximum number of mature believers for a pivot. We should have maximum evangelism within your own nation, maximum missionary activity to other nations, and also the client nation is to provide a haven for the Jews. All this we've done in the past, but we're not utilizing our uh, definitely not maximum number of mature believers. Uh, evangelism has gone astray into some false methods. Uh, missionary activity has gone into some false notions. And uh, so far we still provide a haven for the Jew. The client nation is characterized always by being pro-Semitic. So let's look at the fullness of the Gentiles. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11, 25, which explains the fullness of of the Gentiles which our Lord mentions until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So what is the fullness of the Gentiles? Romans 11.25 Romans 11.25 Now I'll go ahead and give you the corrected translation. For believers, I do not wish you to be ignorant of this mystery. This mystery refers to Musterion which is church age doctrine reserved for the church only lest you become presumptuous that presumptuous means to be wise in your own estimation not based on the estimation of Bible doctrine not based on looking into the mirror of the Word of God not based on a confidence in the Lord or a confidence in doctrine but wise by human standards in your own estimation that a partial hardening has occurred to Israel until the full measure of Gentile nations has come in. So this is the Apostle Paul referencing the fact and prophesying the fact that Israel, until the second advent, will always be trampled over by the Gentiles. And if you wonder why today Israel is such a target of hostility, it's biblical in nature. A partial hardening has occurred and the partial hardening means there will always be a few Jews in every generation that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but there, there will never be enough to form a pivot for there to be Israel, as this is the time of the Gentiles. So the word translated Gentile nations is the Greek word ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S. That's where we get our English word ethnicity, ethnos. And this word means... Gentiles and Gentile nations. The full measure of the Gentile nations is all Gentile client nations from the fall of Israel in August of 70 AD until the end of the church age which is Im imminent but we do not know the date. The full measure of Gentile nations refers to the time of the Gentiles with one slight difference. The times of the Gentiles goes from August of 70 AD until the second advent. The full measure of the Gentiles has to do with the fact that there will always be Gentile client nations until the resurrection of the church. After the resurrection, believers are taken out and therefore the tribulation begins. The ambassadors must be removed first. That's why any type of mid-tribulation rapture idea or post-tribulation rapture idea is false. And that's because a declaration of war occurs when there's a withdrawal of ambassadors. So the ambassadors must be withdrawn first and then the war begins. 
So all the ambassadors, all believers in the church age who are alive at the time of the rapture will be absent. They will be, uh, in, they will be in the clouds with the Lord in the air. So uh, during the tribulation, there is no client nation and Israel is not yet restored as a client nation. So you see the restraint of the client nation is gone and as a result of the restraint being gone, there is a viciousness that occurs after three and a half years of what seems to be peace, peace when there is no peace. Turning your Bibles to Exodus 34 verse 29. Exodus 34 verse 29. Exodus 34 29 deals with the Mosaic Law and its fading glory. And this is another reason as to why Israel is not a client nation to God anymore. And it has to do with the fading glory of the Mosaic Law. Most Jews today still want to follow the Mosaic Law. Even those Jews who have believed in Christ always seem to gravitate back to the Mosaic Law, which is inferior to the spiritual life in the church age. And there is a fading glory of the Mosaic Law, which we find in Exodus 34:29, in which Moses made a prophetic gesture in relationship to Israel as God's covenant people. That's Exodus 34:29. This gesture may be classified as the doctrine of the fading glory. And this is in contrast to our wonderful spiritual life in the church age. So this is the doctrine of the unfading glory that we live under, the church age. The glory of the spiritual life in the church age is unfading, while the Mosaic law is a fading glory, and it has faded as we are now in the church age. Exodus 34, 29 through 35. Now it came to pass when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, with the two tablets of testimony in his hands, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face was shining because he had been talking with him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. So Moses called to them. Then Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. Then Moses spoke to them, and afterward all the sons of Israel came near. And he commanded them everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Mo Moses had finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Now whenever Moses went in face to face with the Lord to speak with him, he took off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Moses put on the veil after speaking God's word to the people. He did this so that Israel could not see the fading glory of the Mosaic law. Moses understood that Israel must hear the message and not associate the message with the fact that the Mosaic law or and that Israel excuse me, Israel was to understand at that time that this system is a system of fading glory. He did not want to, he did not want Israel to associate the message with the Mosaic law as being a fading glory, even though Moses knew it would be, but he did not know what was to come or he would have died with envy. Israel was not to understand at that time that all the five of the Jewish client nations to come would sooner or later fail because of rejection to Bible doctrine. So as soon as Moses entered the tabernacle, he removed the veil and he kept it off until he was finished listening to the Lord and speaking to the people of Israel. The prophetic gesture of Moses provides a historical background and interpretation for the unfading glory of the unique spiritual life of the church age. The unique spiritual life of the church age for the believer is an unfading glory. We have something superior to in the church age. Any form of the spiritual life in the Old Testament, 
any form of the spiritual life during the time of Israel, any form of the spiritual life uh, during the tribulation will go back to the faith rest drill, and it is superior to any form of the spiritual life that occurs in the millennium. We have more now than has ever been given or ever will be given in any other dispensation. And Moses gives a prophetic gesture and it shows his understanding of the fact that the unique spiritual life of the church age is where all the true glory will occur and it will not fade. For there is no fading glory in the spiritual life of the church age. So you have a power that Moses did not have. And you say, but the Red Sea split right in two. Isn't that fantastic? He put the rod down, as the Lord told him, and it split. We have that power. We have a greater power. It's unseen. It's invisible. But it's greater than splitting the Red Sea. That should wake some people up, but it doesn't seem to. So if the spiritual life is rejected, there is a veil over the soul of the believer in the church age and that's called scar tissue of the soul and I've seen it happen to many believers over my short lifetime so far and I've seen I've seen notebooks left behind by people who've left and they were packed with doctrine so much so that I could preach from their notebooks but now where are they they're not listening to the word anymore and their life will be misery until they go out under the sin face to face with death they don't wake up and return to Bible doctrine people do not do what the word of God says because there's a veil over their soul so they can write it down they can make a beautiful notebook filled with page and page and page of doctrine but they don't do what it says because they don't maintain any filling of God the Holy Spirit. As soon as Bible class ends, uh, they're thinking of something else, and they go outside of fellowship, and they go right back to their wretched ways in the cosmic system without rebound. Church is not the only place where you live the spiritual life. Church is where you learn it. Outside of church is where you apply it, and the only way you can apply it is to be filled with God the Holy Spirit and to, therefore, have God the Holy Spirit recall to mind those doctrines you need during times of testing, during times of punishment that turns into testing, when you rebound, etc. And uh, to verify what I'm saying, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. There's no way you could get that just from reading from the Old Testament, what I just said, so where does it come from? It comes from the Musterion doctrine given by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.13, who explains this fading glory, this veil. It's actually the Apostle Paul who came to understand the doctrine of the veil. 2 Corinthians 3.13-18 And not as Moses, who kept on putting a veil over his face, to prevent the sons of Israel from gazing at his face while the radiance was fading away. But their thinking was hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. You can go to a, oh, uh, what, the, what do you call it, the, one of the temples, one of the temples that uh, the uh, Jews go to today, and you can listen to them say in Hebrew, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, is a, and they do this as a version of ritual, but it has no reality, because what they are saying is, Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ is unique, but that's not a reality to them, they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they say it as part of a ritual. So for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant the same veil remains unlifted because it is only removed by Christ. For until this very day whenever Moses is read a veil covers their heart and whatever it, the Jewish heart, 
has turned face to face with the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Spirit is the Lord, that is, God the Holy Spirit, referring to the deity of God the Holy Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What type of freedom? Spiritual freedom. We've been talking about both human and spiritual freedom. Spiritual freedom being the highest of all the freedoms. But we all, with an unveiled face, looking into a mirror to produce a reflection, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory, that's referencing the prototype spiritual life, to glory, that is the operational spiritual life of the believer in the church age, as it were from the spirit of the Lord. In other words, we have the same spiritual life that our Lord lived while he was on the earth, though we will never take it to such heights and we will never take it to such glory as only our Lord could do so as the one without sin without blemish so this is our spiritual freedom and under the concept of spiritual freedom we have something that can only occur because it, only God can make it occur in terms of human freedom freedom means inequality Human freedom means that there will be rich people and there will be poor people. Whenever you get into a society where everybody seems to be living the same, all poor, then you know that that society is not free. A free people will produce winners and losers. As far as human standards are concerned, there will be rich, there will be poor, there will be those who make it, and there will be those who don't. There will be those who will make it under a system of freedom and then there will be those who will go to jail and or go to prison and spend out their life in prison because they violated freedom in some way through murder, rape, etc. But in the spiritual life we have freedom plus equality and that cannot occur under human freedom. Uh, this isn't taught in college so much so I wrote a paper on human freedom and the fact that uh, freedom and equality are mutually exclusive. Then the teacher made a notation, did you not mean mutually inclusive? But then I explained later on what I meant and he got it. So I said, no teacher, I, I meant what I wrote. And he said, no, I got it when I read later on. He didn't like what he read, but I still got an A on the paper. He was a fair teacher and ex extraordinarily versed in English. He d taught me a lot of things with regard to the English language. And uh, I taught him a few things too, but I don't think he uh, wanted to hear it. But uh, we have spiritual freedom. Now, the only place where freedom and equality can exist is in the spiritual life. There is no freedom and equality in human terms. The French tried to do it in the French Revolution. They called it fraternity and they wanted equality and freedom. Well you can't have freedom and equality in human terms but in spiritual terms only. And that means that when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ you were given freedom to choose for or against the spiritual life that you would live afterwards and you were given equality and that means equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the spiritual life. And you say, well, I didn't get on doctrine until I was 40. In fact, uh, I was going to this legalistic church, and all of a sudden I realized I wasn't learning anything. And then at the time of 40 years old, I said, I'm going to get with Bible doctrine. And you say, but this other person was born into a family listening to Bible doctrine. How I would have loved to have been born into a family that listened to Bible doctrine. My, I would be just as far along or farther along than the other person who started in the home. That's not true. You started on doctrine when you were 40 because you went positive toward the Word when you were 40. I started on Bible doctrine when I was 13 because I was positive at 13. I was positive beforehand, but I started putting things together at the age of 13 and started to understand the importance of the Word of God at the age of 13. You say, well, I could have I done that. 
No, if you were going to be positive at 13, God would have given it to you at 13. You weren't positive at age 13. And God knows everything from beginning to end. So I was placed into a family where I would have it readily available as soon as possible. And that doesn't make me great. I just made a choice. I'm not great at all. Everything is uh, by grace. I just flipped the light switch and said, yes, this is important. And that's all you have to do is say, yes, this is the most important thing ever. Everything else is inconsequential or secondary or tertiary in what is my responsibility. Your first and foremost responsibility as a believer is to take in the word of God. And of course you have to, you can't say, well I'm going to quit work and just, no. You have to provide for your family, etc. and work. That's just part of it and uh, I'm going to have to work. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit more able and I think I'll be uh, ready and able to work at some point anyway as long as there's a job out there part-time or whatever work with my own hands and also continue with giving Bible doctrine Apostle Paul had to do it I'm not beneath it either so when Moses pulled down the veil over his face it was as if the Jews had pulled down a veil over their own hearts the phrase their thinking was hardened means they rejected his teaching they had scar tissue on their soul. The Exodus generation was one of the worst generations of believers in all of human history. And they were free to succeed or fail, and that generation chose to fail, and they all died, every one of them, except Caleb and Joshua of, an, of a younger generation. They all died and sin face to face with death in the middle of a desert. Is that how you want to go out? Well, choose to fail. Choose to take this freedom you have and equality, equal privilege and equal opportunity, and throw it away and say, no, you can do it. You have freedom to do it. Now, children shouldn't have freedom, but they say, no, that's probably one of the first words they learn, no. And then they learn, uh, well, they're constantly under the influence of the old sin nature. So they learn everything with regards to the old sin nature very quickly. Operation Patsy, etc. Uh, on vacation with my son Luke, he happened to pop his birthday balloon, one of many. <laughs> and as soon as he popped it, he, he didn't like the fact that it was now gone and he didn't have a balloon anymore. So he had to uh, get upset over that. And then uh, I got him another balloon as I was uh, taking him back home and uh, to his mother. And immediately when we got back in the car and he had his new balloon, balloon, he went ahead to blame the closest person in his periphery, which was Grandma, who had been sitting in the back seat. He said, uh, I got this new balloon because Grandma broke my other one but it was obvious he broke his own balloon operation patsy that is related to the old sin nature and people in their thirties forties fifties and sixties still operate as children even though they are believers but they operate as children because they live under carnality constantly and they always have to blame someone else for their troubles or their problems or they do something that destroys their own life but they're not going to take the blame for it they're going to blame someone else because their life is destroyed. They'll blame the government, they'll blame uh, their fellow man, their whoever else. And we have a whole system that encourages this Operation Patsy. Blame your parents for raising you wrong, etc. But that's wrong. You have equal privilege and equal opportunity no matter what your environment, good or bad. Mine was good. Yours may, be, may have been terrible, but you can't blame your environment. You can only blame your own volition and that might be a hard pill to swallow but uh, you got to let go of the past and move forward disregarding those things that are behind is part of moving forward in the spiritual life and it's not only referencing disregarding those sins you've committed 
but also disregarding that garbage that you're always trying to blame your parents or your grandparents or whoever raised you for your problems. Now, we do live in a society where we have a lot of problems because we don't have how God designed family, mother, father, children. But you had an authority, and uh, while you may have been abused and you might have a lot of buildup of garbage, you can cycle it out by choice. So there's a hardening of the heart, scar tissue of the soul. And a lot of those in the Exodus generation, all of them had been abused by slavery. They had probably all experienced rape at a young age by their taskmaster. They had all lived under a ruthless system. They had all uh, seen the evil religion of the Egyptians. Many of them practiced that evil religion as well and many of them return to it but that background of slavery was no excuse for the freedom that they'd been given and the fact that they wasted it they were held accountable because there's no partiality with God and so too was Moses though there's only uh, once he got out into the desert with them there's only one recorded instance in which he failed, that's recorded, in which he had a major failure in his spiritual life, he went into Operation Patsy, and he blamed the Jews because he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. He got angry. He chose to become angry. And then he did just like a child and said, You caused God to get angry with me. No. Moses failed, and there was no partiality with God. And Moses was punished severely for his failure. He did not get to go into the land. And that really tore him up in his older age. He got over it. He rebounded. He kept moving. Then he went up on the mountain and died. And he did not die to sin face to face with death, of course. Moses ended as a, one of the greatest believers of all times. So there could be no Gentile client nations until the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, so that any born-again Jew could be part of that client nation. And that client nation, excuse me, is not Israel. Now the full measure of Gentiles does not exclude the Jew at all. Uh, in fact, in every generation, there is a Jew who goes to maturity, but and they have the uh, ability to become part of the client nation. But in the Old Testament they had a fading glory. We have an unfading glory. And how do I know each generation has a, a Jew that goes to maturity? There's always a remnant that's called according to the few and that was that's quoted in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament referring to a remnant. There's always a remnant of the Jew that goes to maturity in the spiritual life. And there are many, many Jews. There are Jews who probably don't even know they're Jews, so you can't even, only God knows uh, really who's a Jew and who's not. Uh, because even if you have a, a trace of the blood, you're a Jew. That's why Hitler did all kinds of crazy things in trying to purify the race, as he would call it. But we have an unfading glory. And we have a greater responsibility than anyone during the time of the five Jewish client nations. And if we reject the spiritual life that has an unfading glory, how much more severely will we be disciplined than those Jews who rejected a fading glory? We have a greater responsibility. With greater privilege comes greater responsibility. And in essence... We are face to face with the Lord when we hear the teaching of the Word of God that's contained in the New Testament canon, the Musterion doctrine. So the unveiled face is what we have as a hope, as a client nation to God. Utopian socialism is an evil, and that's not our hope or our confidence. People really don't even know what hope means. Uh, the connotation of hope in the English language, 
hope is whatever you make out of it. Uh, I hope so, you could say, and that means, well, I hope this occurs, or that actually it's the opposite of confidence. You're not, when you say, I hope so, you are displaying lack of confidence. You don't know if it's going to happen or not, but you're hoping so. But that's not the meaning of hope in the Bible. The meaning of hope is confidence. And you can't place your confidence in a human system, which is really a system developed by Satan, under Satan's cosmic system, utopian socialism. And that's an economic system based on the premise that if capital has voluntarily surrendered its ownership of means of production to the state and the workers, unemployment and poverty will be abolished. And that's a joke. No one voluntarily surrenders their capital. No one voluntarily surrenders their ownership or their property. And it can't be done voluntarily. It's always done by force. And it's always done by the state. And unemployment and poverty will always be with us. As our Lord said, the poor will be with us always. So you can see socialism is antithetical to what our Lord said, so therefore it's a satanic system. Socialism is evil. I don't care the personalities who are involved in that evil. They're evil. And it really doesn't matter uh, the difference of who's president as far as personality goes if they have the same thinking. And our, uh, the people today in the United States, they have no clue of the viciousness of socialism. Now back in the 1960s, we were terrified of socialism. But now, we embrace it. That shows the degeneration of our country. Now we live under it. And how's it going for you? The redistribution of wealth is disastrous to an economy. And that's why we've lost the vigor of our economy in less than half a decade from the divine establishment viewpoint. For capitalism is the only economic system that God approves. And it's the only system that creates prosperity. Not only does God approve, God created it when he told Moses, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. All of that is part of freedom. And it goes for government too. Thou shalt not steal. When tax rates went up to 91% under the Roosevelt administration, that's theft. It's amazing we even got through those times. But we did because of a pivot. So capitalism is the only economic system that creates prosperity. One thing we can take solace in is the fact that Jesus Christ controls history. And these are the principles involved in the fact that Jesus Christ controls history. I know this all too well because we should have been gone as a client nation many years ago. And right now we are holding on by a thread for whatever reason. Either God is extending some grace to see if there will be response. He already knows, but he has to extend the grace as part of his righteous policy and gracious policy. And he's going to see, he knows, but we're going to find out whether there will be a turnaround, a, an evangelization of the populace, plus the fact that believers will get on Bible doctrine. It's going to be dependent upon what this generation does, what the newer generation does, Right now, they're failing. But that doesn't mean much. They can succeed later. They can change their mind. The times get tough and hard enough. But they have a short window of time in which to do so because their hearts will become hardened. And it will become ever harder to accept the Word of God. It will become foreign to them. And in many cases, they've gotten into college and into such evil any idea of divine establishment is foreign to them. They don't understand it whatsoever. They don't understand marriage. They don't understand volition. They don't understand the basics of human life that an unbeliever can understand. Anyway, that's a tragedy. And we're going to, very shortly, if there's not a turnaround within the next half decade, we're over. But Jesus Christ controls history. I can say that definitely. But that Jesus Christ controls history, history 
and he can say, no, you're not over yet, there's still a small pivot left here, and or there's been a rebound over here, and therefore uh, I'm going to extend some time. So I, I don't control history, but I can read the trends of history, and we don't have long. Number one, he controls history through the function of his divine essence. Jesus Christ controls history. Number one, he controls history through the function of his divine essence. That means through the essence of God. He's omniscient, omnipotent, etc. Number two, he controls history as a judge of the Supreme Court of Heaven. Jesus Christ as judge now sits in judgment of this country, and we're under the third or even fourth cycle of discipline. I've yet to determine. Because do you know that uh, during Hitler's time, he would surreptitiously install, try to install his own government in a foreign land using the democratic system. And uh, he installed one puppet of his government without the democracy even though they just voted for the guy because he sounded good. Uh, that's why democracy is not that great of a system. A republic is, but we're, we are pretty close to a democracy now in which everyone, every idiot gets to vote, and every idiot votes for an idiot. And so, somebody sounds good, they get a majority of the vote, and yet they're the puppet of another government. It happened during Hitler's time, and he was able to manipulate a democracy. And he uh, had this puppet dictator, and this puppet dictator... He wanted that puppet dictator to rule for eight years, and then afterwards he would just come in and take over. And during those eight years, that puppet government would provide free wine and uh, free pros or what seemed to be prosperity, but it, would just, it was just a socialist system of borrowing money and then weakening the people by taking away their vigor, and then he'd just go in and take it over. And that was his idea. Sometimes it didn't succeed the way he wanted. And uh, sometimes I wonder about our own government, but that doesn't matter. Jesus Christ controls history as a judge of the Supreme Court of Heaven. And number three, he controls history through the pivot of mature believers in the client nation. So even if some scheme were hatched like that, and it occurred in this nation, it doesn't matter because Jesus Christ is the one who controls history and we can move right through such a historical disaster and go back to functioning as a client nation by a simple uh, volition of the pivot or of people joining the pivot. Number four, he controls history through the utilization of the wrath of man to praise him. Psalms 76.10 explains that. The wrath of man to praise him, controlling history, what's a good example of that? That would be Moses uh, going through and splitting the sea and then having the destruction of the greatest army of that day, the army, the Egyptian army, and uh, the wrath of man, see, the king or the pharaoh of Egypt decided to go after Moses while he was in the desert due to his hardness of heart and because of his wrath, because of his hardness of heart, his scar tissue, a whole evangelization of the world began because they all heard of the destruction of the greatest military of their day, the Egyptian military, and they heard of the great miracle of the splitting of the Red Sea, and as a result, evangelization occurred throughout all of the world at that time. So he used the wrath of man, the wrath of Pharaoh, to praise him. Because of the wrath of Pharaoh, it ended up that many people were evangelized. You can't stop God's plan. You might become, go into Cosmic 2 and become a hater of Bible doctrine, a hater of those who teach Bible doctrine, and try to scheme. Well, your schemes will simply turn out to praise God. Your hardness of heart doesn't hinder God's plan, he's already put it into the equation to where it's going to help him in every case. You can't stop God's plan. Number five, 
He controls history through the preservation of Israel against all anti-Semitism, both satanic and the sin nature conspiracy against uh, the Jew. If you're one who's gone into anti-Semitism, you're a fool. Can get away from me. God's punishment is sure to come. And I don't want to be around you. Number six, plus your thinking is gross and satanic, and that's the main reason I wouldn't want to be around you. And the other reason is you're about to be hit hard with divine discipline. One, two, three, four, five. Number six, he controls history through the preservation of planet Earth. Global warming is a farce because Jesus Christ controls history. For Jesus Christ not only created the universe, Hebrews 1.10, but he holds the universe together by the word of his power. Hebrews 1.3 Global warming is not going to destroy this earth. It will destroy capitalism, which is what it's designed to do. And a bunch of boobs follow it because they're stupid. And it's just a way to destroy the greatest system and this client nation. A way to tr try to destroy this client nation is through this environmental wackiness and all it does is hinder business uh, for example the excuse is used for the digging of that pipeline from Canada down to Houston and uh, we're just not digging we're not going to do it we say it hurts the environment no not doing it hurts the environment because then it has to be taken by rail which is an old way of doing things. There's some things behind that that I won't go into. Number seven, he controls history through the preservation of planet Earth. Was it one, two, three, four, five? That's six. He controls history through the preservation of planet Earth, and he holds the universe together by the word of his power. No man can't do it through nuclear warfare or anything, because Jesus Christ controls history. And since Jesus Christ controls history, he provides freedom for the function of human volition. And number seven, he controls history through the second advent, and there he will terminate the last and greatest world war of history. And if he doesn't do that, of course, mankind would destroy himself. But he will intervene at the second advent, and the last and greatest world war of all history will be ended, and then there will be no more war. So uh, tomorrow, we will continue with the principles of confidence for a client nation, where we should place our hope. We'll have some concluding principles on freedom, a look at insecurity and what has happened as far as the breakup of family, breakup of the divine institutions that are hindering this country and resulting in its downfall along with the spin-off of the pivot in which most believers are now in reversionism and care not for the Word of God. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to what we've noted and may we come to understand the importance of our spiritual life. May we continue to daily Make it number one, and to pursue the Word of God as David did, so that we will meditate on it both day and night. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.